What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast. I'm super excited about today's guest because Evan Shapiro is the CEO of O1 Labs and a board member of one of the show's amazing sponsors, Mina Labs. O1 Labs is using cryptography and cryptocurrency to build computing systems that put people back in control of their digital lives and give people the tools to build more empowering and useful crypto systems. All that all sounds like techie jargon. I assure you that it's really important and groundbreaking, and I'm looking forward to hearing why. Evan Shapiro, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. So once again, before we get into it, this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where twice a week I talk to your favorite personalities from the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, trading, art, music, sports, politics, literally anyone with a good story to tell. This show is powered by BlockWorks. They've got over 20 Bitcoin and crypto podcasts in their network. You can check them out at blockworks.co for access to the highest quality information in the space. And if you like the podcast, you follow me on Twitter, please check out everything else I have to offer, my newsletter, et cetera. You can find that all at thewolfofallstreets.io. Now to get in today's episode, your goal is for people to take control of their digital lives. Was the original intention of the internet to take control of people's lives or did that just sort of happen? Well, <laughs> it's, it's a funny question because like, as far as I know, like, like reading into the stuff, like the original intention was for people to take control of, of their lives. It was that this was a, you know, kind of utopian digital system outside of the realms of the normal confines of politics and other kind of physical constraints that people would be free to kind of, you know, feel the, actuate their full potential. And clearly that like has been kind of co-opted at this point, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that is like, yeah. So I'm assuming it's been co-opted by the companies and corporations and such that have used it and not as a result of the actual technology. I would, I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what does it mean for you then to say that, you know, you're, you're giving people control of their digital lives? Well, I, I think it's really about giving people the tools to be able to kind of equalize the power with like these entities that are taking control right now of the internet. Um, right now, as like a user, you go to these websites, you don't know what they're doing. You, you well, you kind of do know they're, they're taking information and they're selling it and they're using it to make a lot of money. But, but um, you know, you don't, you, you as a user don't have any um, kind of check against that power that they have. And this is one thing that cryptocurrency, crypto cryptography and cryptocurrency can particularly bring is like this, um, kind of tool that users can put back on these companies to say, hey, like you have to be doing it this way um, because that's like, you know, either, you know, the, the standard these companies are, you know, in the future going to go up to because like they know that users are upset about these things now um, or, or for regulatory reasons or elsewhere. But anyway, cryptography can, can put these requirements back onto these companies. Can you tell me exactly how that works? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Like, I think that, there's like a technical answer here and there's like a much more complicated kind of social answer that like, I think that like, I'm just starting to like kind of explore myself and feel out. Um, and it will take like a large group effort and everyone's behalf to, to figure it out for real. But the technical part of it is these, this technique of zero knowledge proofs, this ability for, um, you know, a, a humble user with like their phone or their browser to, uh, both receive zero knowledge proofs that say that this huge computation involving all this data and, um, you know, it resulted in this result. And, you know, you with your tiny little laptop or phone don't, can't clearly can't, you can't do that. You can't run that data, but right. like the proof that here's a proof that um it did what you expected it to do. Here's a proof that like we followed this regulation. Here's a proof that like we didn't steal all your data. Here's a proof how, how we, how we ran this computation. The other half of it is as a user, I can then um, compute a proof myself that includes some of my information I need to use these services, but includes them with some privacy so that I can give that proof back to these services and give them what they need to do the service I'm asking them to do without giving them what might be like really sensitive or personal information underlying that proof. So it's these two halves of it where like, you know, you have like our, us with our little devices and we can sort of start thinking about interacting with entities in a way that's that's more safe. So as it stands right now, when you provide someone information outside of this uh, ideal system, obviously they get a lot more information than they need, basically is what we're saying. And then they're able to monetize package and pass that information along for a profit. Yeah, exactly. Wow. 
It's kind of scary. Um, it's actually really terrifying <laughs> yeah. when you think about it. So can you give some real world examples of, um, you know, where, where this is meaningful? I think I, when I was reading through your guys' stuff, obviously an example was a credit report, correct? Yeah. Let, I, I, let me give that one then. Yeah. So you want to use a website that needs your credit report for whatever reason. We're applying this right now with a partner to uh, uncollateralized loans on crypto, but you can imagine credit scores come up a lot. Right now to do this, you have to basically provide them enough information that they can verify your identity and get the credit score themselves, which means that your social security number, which means all this information that like is kind of like much more applicable than just like, there's like this request we want them to do, which is like get credit score or get some fact about the credit score. And really what we're giving them is like, you know, kind of like, you know, admin control of our identity, which is not, not, not ideal. Um, the alternative with zero knowledge proofs is that you can instead provide a proof that this, you know, other identity provider, like let's say Credit Karma, uh, they've attested to my credit score being, you know, within some threshold, maybe at least, you know, between 740 and 750. And I can provide them a proof of that uh, without providing them all like the other information they would, you know, be able to use to, to you know, control my life otherwise. So, so interesting. Um, and can this eventually be applied to almost everywhere that we provide personal information on the internet? Yeah, I, yeah. So this is, this would, I think like, this is like the, the hopefully like happy end goal is, is that uh, all these places right now where you're providing all this information, you would instead provide zero knowledge proofs and therefore you would retain control over like, really like, you know, all, all like the external facts that, that make up who you are on like the internet. So is this theoretical or are we already seeing zero knowledge proofs being used in practice? So it's, it's real. Um, I, it, it, like we're, we're not quite at every company adopting this and everything, but the technology is there and working. Uh, zero knowledge proofs themselves have been around a few years now and they're recently going into production in a major way in like both our system and others. The, and I would say like the, the new cutting edge thing is that now that like the tech stack is there to build these things, starting to apply them uh, to products like we are with this credit score example. Um, so I, I think it's just really starting to take off. It's a yeah exciting time for us. <laughs> yeah, with, with the credit score example, really interesting. So even though you can deliver the zero knowledge proof, you still have to have a trusted third party like Credit Karma that basically vets and approves the, the data, correct? So there still has to be somebody that has at some point uh, giving confirmation that you are who you are and, and the information that you're providing is what it is. Yeah. I, and I think that that's for this example in particular, because this data is kind of dependent on a world where there wasn't already zero knowledge proofs there. Like we're, it was, it started in a world where like, you know, there are all of these companies kind of trading trust with each other. Um, so you do have these entities that are part of that, like kind of trust network. You have to like kind of lift up into zero knowledge proof land. Sure. But what you can imagine doing is that in the future, once everything is starting to be zero knowledge proofed, then we can kind of, you know, we don't really need that anymore. We can just start like compiling these zero knowledge proofs themselves in a way that's permissionless. And we don't need to like have this trusted step, but this is the bootstrap way of uh, getting, getting this to start happening. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it'd be impossible, obviously, to just yeah. flick a switch <laughs> and, and go from one system entirely to the other. So I'm really curious because I mean, to me, this is like very heady and something that uh, I don't think your average person would have just thought of, but it's so important. How did you get here? Like, what's your background? Where did you start? You know? Yeah. So I, I guess like for me, like kind of like the origin of all this is like kind of, kind of in high school. Um, um, I met my, my co-founder in high school. We were like good friends back then as well as it goes now, but like, um, we spent like a lot of our time just kind of like in the library between classes talking about technology and where it was going um, and learning about things like cryptocurrency. Um, and it was like a very formative time. And like, I think that kind of like the, the insight or like the, you know, naive kind of assumption then was like, oh, like cryptocurrency can use to spin up a new social reality. Like we can spin up like whatever we want um, in code. And then we can like, you know, if people like it, they can start using it. And it's like a new institution that can be built. And that, that like, this, this was like, I guess, where we, both of us started getting really interested in this technology and in crypt and well, not just cryptocurrency, but also programming and math and cryptography, um, which eventually, you know, after we came back after college turned into this whole Ovon Labs and Mina Protocol thing. Uh, but at the time, I think we just like both liked, like, like, you know, chatting and philosophizing on like what technology could potentially do for the future. 
it's it's so mind blowing, and it's funny to hear you talk about uh, thinking about cryptocurrency in high school because I went to high school in the early 1990s, unfortunately. So <laughs> that wasn't quite on our radar yet when we were in high school. Yeah, I, I feel like we like just caught the tail end of it too. Like it was, I, I don't know how we found it. It was like maybe like 2011, 2012. Um, I, I guess I was like on like a lot of like weird niche internet forums and stuff, and somehow I like got across it. Yeah, that that that's pretty early. So, can you talk to me about then exactly what O One Labs is and um, its relationship with Mina? Yeah, so we're like a cryptography and like cryptocurrency zero knowledge proof studio. Um, we've been like incubating and building Mina protocol for the last well, four, like four years now. Um, yeah, it's, it's been it's been a while. Um, and and yeah, so it was, we really built it both to like build this protocol that we felt like could have an impact on how people use cryptocurrency and just maybe like the internet generally. Um, and that's what we've been mostly doing as like, uh, yeah, for the, for the last while. And Mina just had mainnet, correct? Yes. Yeah. So talk, talk about that, please. I, I, I think a lot of people, you know, you hear the term mainnet and you're like, cool. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it means that like, we have like, oh, you know, a, a version of the software that is ready to be in production. And that means like a lot of things product wise, but let me just first start like technically, like, you know, it, it didn't, it, it was like kind of the end of like a very long kind of like, you know, battle with the software over like two years to, to get it into this place, two years of test nets um, where we improved like the stability of the software. We improved the robustness. We improved the performance. We uh, built the community. We got everyone using the software, like all this stuff that, goes into making it real. What it means practically now is that we can start kind of delivering on some of the, like, you know, I'll use the, you know, some, some of like the product goals of, of what we're doing, uh, we, starting to bring these, these uh, snarks and snaps out into the world, as well as bringing Mina's accessibility back to users. Okay, so talk about snarks and snaps because I love how I see Z snark, <laughs> and I had to look it up. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those people. I'm like, what is a Z snark? So, can you talk about what that actually means? Yeah, so there's this class of things called zero knowledge proofs, which like do that thing I sent earlier around you know basically giving users come some oversight and control over how they use their data, how they interact with things. Um, and zk snark is a type of zero knowledge proof. Uh, Starks are also a type of, of zero knowledge proof. These are all types of zero knowledge proofs. Um, so the thing about snarks, which is very cool, um, is that they are succinct. So the size of the snark is independent of how big the information you're kind of throwing into the snark is. You get a proof that the computation is what you want, but you didn't need to, um, you know, you don't need all that data that went into it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a funny property. The, the, the formal statement is like, there exists data such that property holds on that data. Um, so you can, don't have to hold that data on, which gives you privacy and the scalability. The going, taking that over to snaps. So snaps are the zero knowledge proofs on, on Mina. And they let developers leverage these snarks to give their users of those snaps, both privacy and like the efficiency offered by snaps and putting computations on chain. Right. That makes sense. So I, I've read that Mina is considered a lightweight blockchain and actually the numbers are kind of absurd, right? Was it 21 or 22 kilobytes? Yeah. I mean, it's like the size <laughs> of a couple emails, right? It, it's, yeah, it's just like from a complexity perspective, just completely different because usually if you want to like get a trusted state from a blockchain, you have to download all the transactions, you have to like recompute the current state and you have to check that everything kind of, you know, cause like if one thing in the history is like your, your local history is like wrong, like you have to have known about it because otherwise no one else is going to be on the same version of the chain as you. You have to like make sure you're looking at the right thing. The cool thing, oh, sorry, yeah. No, no, please. Yeah, the, the cool thing with uh, what we've done with, with Snarks and Zero Knowledge Proofs is provided a proof of all that history instead of needing a user to download the data. So like, because these proofs are like constant size with respect to like, you know, you can just keep throwing data into like recursively into them and building a bigger proof. Uh, we're in this place where we can have like a few kilobytes stand in for a proof of like the entire history of the chain as well as a proof down to your particular account. Which and so, uh, so why does that matter? I mean, what, what advantages does it give you to have such a lightweight blockchain? Well, it, it does a couple things. So the first is it solves what this, this cryptocurrency trilemma problem that 
scale and decentralization are usually kind of intimately coupled together when you have a cryptocurrency. Like you have something like Bitcoin, for example, um, like uh, right, right after we started the project was like the whole Bitcoin like block wars uh, time where it was, we thought like, oh yeah, like great, like it's happening. Uh, um, where Bitcoin was wondering, should we increase the block size of Bitcoin? Well, if we do that, then the chain's gonna grow faster. It's gonna be harder to access, like how decentralized will it really end up being? Um, and I think very smartly, like they kind of figured out like, oh, like maybe we can't do payments and everything. We just do digital gold, but, um, or some other hive mind like figured that, that out. But, but um, the, the question in general for cryptocurrency is like, you know, if we keep the throughput low, we're gonna have something like digital gold. So that's, that's, that's great, but it doesn't solve everything we want for cryptocurrency, keeps it decentralized, or we can like kind of really crank the throughput up and we have like EOS or Tron or something. And like, right. Like we did it. <laughs> it's really fast, but like, so what effectively you make it faster, but you sacrifice the security of the network. Exactly. Yeah. So with these zero knowledge proofs, we kind of break that, uh, that link because the, um, proof of the history is now decoupled from the, uh, the actual size you need to access this thing. So it's much faster. It's so at the moment, it's actually not much faster. We've oh. like put all of our like cycles into like building the zero knowledge proof thing. And the next step is to start like as we like uh, see demand on the network through uh, snaps and people are accessing the chain this way, uh, we're gonna start, you know, kind of putting cycles into cranking up the throughput. Uh, under the knowledge though, that cranking throughput up doesn't challenge the existing use cases. It just like makes it more usable. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. So how do we transition from a world where, um, you know, obviously we're giving up all our data and all the things we discussed before to where this is the underlying tech of all of these you know, all of these systems and, and every single time that we, we give someone our data, how do we go from start to finish? Yeah, so I, I think what's really interesting to me and like one thing that like I've learned in this company is like, they're, they're like, I, I can tell you the technical solution like right away, like the technical solution, but like, you know, the, the social solution is more complicated. And I'll tell you what I think the, the sketch of that is. Yeah, For, talk about that. Yeah. For the technical solution, like, you know, everyone just has to accept Mina um, as like this blockchain that does this. They have to integrate it into all the browsers in the world. They have to add this to like, uh, what, you know, the spec for, uh, you know, JavaScript APIs and browsers. And then um, we need websites to start creating proofs that they send to these entities instead of what they do now, which is just you like, you know, type all your information in and, and that's what happens. So I think that like, we're not just going to get there <laughs> over overnight. I think that the following things have to happen. I think that what I what I see right now is kind of a good path for this is kind of building you know, into an extension for browsers initially, and this you can imagine is kind of like a super meta mask. This is like a meta mask where like um, <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's a meta mask where uh, you actually you're not going through a third party like an Infura. You actually are getting full trustless access to like the underlying data. And maybe that can even like be bridged to other chains to give you access to their data as well. And probably this, this like, you know, uh, metamasky uh, clone thing, uh, <laughs> or, or really this really new, uh, new thing with, with uh, you know, like it doesn't have probably a private key. It probably has some other identity solution. Maybe what you do is you prove access to an email address um, instead of having to memorize a private key. So right. no one on chain knows what your email address is, but you can use your email address to get access still via these snaps. And so now you have this little extension, you, you know, have a kind of a normal like login thing where it's not like this confusing, like, did you memorize your 14 words? Like, so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> go back and memorize them. Um, and at that point we can start imagining what I think will happen first is um, cryptocurrency products like the recent partner we've brought on and started working with Teller um, start integrating this service into their website. So this is like, really a thing for new companies first that want to start offering the service. And I think once that has started happening, um, there's kind of like a, a, you know, a parallel track, which I'm imagining, which is that people are going to get increasingly sensitive about their data as like AI gets more powerful as these sites are demanding even more data to like make their shareholders happy. And I think that that'll be a point where we start seeing real opportunity for alternative business models for bigger companies where they're like, hey, you know what? We're, we're not going to play this game anymore. We know it's like a losing battle. We're going to start trying to, um, uh, you know, and this is out of self-preservation, of course. They're not like, this, this isn't like, you know, altruistic. Of the good and welfare of uh, humanity, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think at some point, though, like, I, I, I do think that it'll be a big enough deal that companies start adopting it. Like Apple has started doing this in some ways. Um, 
And then I think it can start happening that we can have this start taking effect in the world. What's up, guys? If you've been following me literally for more than five minutes and you don't live under a rock, then you've probably heard me talk about Voyager, which is where I invest and trade Bitcoin and other assets. I love this platform so much. I literally can't stop talking about it. Now, it's so easy to just go download the app, start an account, attach your bank account and start trading 55 assets completely commission free. I've saved so much money on fees. It's a complete joke. And the best part of the whole thing and why honestly I prefer them to everyone else is because while you're trading or holding, you can earn an insane amount of interest up to 10% on USDC, 7.25% on Bitcoin and 6.25% on Ethereum and a number of other assets actually. And all of this is with no lockups or limits. You should absolutely try Voyager. Go to investvoyager.com or you can search for Voyager on the Apple App Store or Google Play Store and get $25 in free Bitcoin when you use my promo code SCOTT25. What are you waiting for? Go. This episode is brought to you by Mina, the world's lightest blockchain powered by participants. Mina uses ZK Snarks to keep the blockchain a fixed size of 22 kilobytes. Bitcoin's ledger is currently 336 gigabytes and growing. That means you can fit 45,000 MENA blockchain proofs in the same storage place. 22 kilobytes is the equivalent of the email you sent your ex asking for your high school sweatshirt back. 22 kilobytes is the equivalent of eight tweets you sent about shrimp tails in your cereal. 22 kilobytes is so small, if it were a ship, it'd fit through the Suez Canal while the evergreen was still stuck there. This means any website, program, or startup can use their blockchain to protect and verify data without the need to run a massive node. The ecosystem is growing so fast and Mina's mainnet has just gone live, offering users a platform to build a private gateway between the real world and crypto. And a reminder that Mina's public token sale, only available to non-US persons, will take place on April 13th with their official partner, Coinless. Go to minaprotocol.com slash wolf to find out more. DeFi is where all the excitement is, but participating in it can be a nightmare. Not anymore with Matcha. Matcha makes it ridiculously easy to create a wallet, onboard new users, execute trades, and source liquidity. The best part is that it's cheaper than Uniswap and delivers the best prices on the market by aggregating all the available liquidity and routing to the best source. My favorite part of Matcha is that it offers high-level trading features like limit orders, liquidity depth visualization, gas efficiency, and more. Sign up for Matcha now at matcha.xyz slash wolf. That's M-A-T-C-H-A dot X-Y-Z slash W-O-L-F and join the tens of thousands of traders who are already a part of the movement. At least at this point, I think there's two obvious problems in society. One is that they want as much data as they can to sell. And two is that people really don't seem to care about giving it all up for convenience. Right? I I mean, I, yes, I agree on the first one. On the second one, I, I guess like I'm, I'm torn on the second one. I feel like if you look at people's behavior on the internet, like I'm like, yeah, like people clearly don't care. Like they're, they're just using these services continually. But I, I guess like what, what I, I mean, it's it feels to me like the sentiment is starting to shift. I don't know how much it will shift towards like people starting to care about this more. Uh, and I think... I think that like today it's kind of borderline, but like I can imagine some very creepy use cases involving AI and all this data that start making me feel like, oh, there's like gonna be like the Cambridge Analytica moment of like five years from now where like everyone's right. like, oh shit, like maybe this was like really bad idea. <laughs> and, yeah. I would love to hear you posit on the potential risks of AI and data. I, I mean, like, I think we have like these, this is a little abstract at first. Like we have like these, these kind of like digital agents that like are, you know, they're, they're not, they're not humans. They're just kind of like machine learning algorithms and they're optimized to, to make money and they're optimized to like um, do what they can to manipulate our behavior um, to, to make that happen. And it's like, you know, we're like a little human, like we like, you know, our like system one, system two with our like, you know, <laughs> kind of built in way of looking at the world. And they're just like this, like all powerful AI thingy. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, I, I can imagine, and like, I think this is like a little like maybe uh, forward thinking potentially or just crazy is like, we, we're in this world right now where like, you know, companies want to harvest our survey data to like, you know, get better ad profiles of us. That's like well and good. I, I think though that there is an overwhelming amount of data that people post on Instagram, people post on um, Facebook, on all these websites. And I think 
it could really end up giving an AI an extremely detailed profile of who we are, who we want to be, what we want, what we're dissatisfied with, what would make us happy. Um, and I think, you know, if you imagine this, they're kind of like wielding this like a blunt object, it's going to just be very turn off and like people are just going to like run away from it. But uh, that's not how they're going to be optimized to operate. They're going to be optimized to operate within the confines of like, we have to like kind of trick people into doing what we want based on this information to make us more money. And uh, that maybe is not like quite as specific as like, uh, I'd, I'd like to have an answer, but th well, that's what we're far fetched at all. Yeah. I mean, I had you my you mind shake of a uh, fetch on the show not long ago. And uh, we had a very detailed sort of conversation about the agents and all the things that, you know, AI and stuff can do. And he effectively convinced me that we were in the matrix. So, <laughs> yeah. And in terms of just like the AIs are just kind of like watching everything at this point and like what we're- And like, that's what they're developing is that AIs will effectively will do everything for us, the agents, as you said, like, you know, the tr reading traffic for cars and, and things like that, but all these basic things and as they add up and compound, but then on a total side note, he literally like almost convinced we were living in a simulation, which I guess is a total- mm, uh, <laughs> next, Yeah, next level. <laughs> To, to like, I guess like put a metaphor on top of this, like I kind of imagine zero knowledge reach is like the things that bind these agents that like kind of bind them to our will in some like, uh, you know, fantasy setting or something <laughs> that, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like unconstrained right now. And they're even controlled by actors that don't have our best interest in mind, but maybe with like zero knowledge proofs, we can start kind of like, you know, putting our confines on them to have them do what we want. So what was your tipping point moment where you decided that this was specifically what you wanted to focus on? Obviously you are a programmer, you could probably be doing anything in cryptocurrency. Was there something that happened like, I don't know, was there just some aha moment with corporations or something that you went through with your data that made you realize, wow, there's a huge problem. I don't want this all out there. I I think what happened was I, I think, I think like, well, a couple, so a couple of things. So and, and, you know, this is like, you know, I don't have like a super clean, this is like the messy version that actually like went down is like, I was, I was pursuing robotics and machine learning <laughs> as a like, you know, career path. I was going to go do a PhD in, uh, in robotics. And at some point I kind of realized like, this didn't really feel like the, <laughs> I, I, I just like, didn't love the idea of being an academic, first of all, for, for like, you know, a long time for like doing that for a long time. And also I just didn't feel like that was like, I guess like connected to like the things that I cared about and like the things that like I, as a technical problem, like thousand percent, like I, I love the work, but like at some point I think I just started like getting drawn back into cryptocurrency because it felt more like socially relevant. It felt like that was like um, the, the, the place where the world was like kind of uh, happening way that connected to real people. Um, and I think that this was also kind of colored by like my kind of dy dystopic visions of, of, of AI. <laughs> yeah. But, that, um, that totally <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. And I, I don't, I mean, the dystopic visions I think are becoming a lot more mainstream to be quite frank as the technology yeah. has developed. It, it's funny, you know, people used to say we were insane for thinking Bitcoin was important. People used to say you were insane if you thought that there was a dystopian future with AI and both have sort of hand in hand evolved as to more normal. I'm curious, yeah, yeah I, I'm curious for you has this pursuit become easier as a businessman, as a programmer, as we've actually seen this sort of mainstream awareness of Bitcoin and it, I, I guess a very superficial level about cryptocurrency? It, it's, it's funny because like the, the, like the, the, like the super mainstream awareness, like what like my parents read in like, you know, Forbes or whatever, like lags the space by like, you know, four years or something crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think that like kind of my like awareness of like that has like developed as like, I've also been just like, we've been, you know, spending time like working on zero knowledge proofs and stuff. So like, I don't think I really wrapped my mind <laughs> around it yet. And like, I'm still like maybe living a little bit in the future, but um, I think that it does, it's really exciting because I think that I do, it does make me see a path to the stuff going mainstream in a way where the stuff that we're working on can also um, play a part in that. And like, if you asked me that like four years ago when we started this, I would have no idea if like Bitcoin would be like, you know, be in that place and, and it is, which is incredible.
Right. So you can somewhat piggyback on it, which is nice. And it's so funny. You talk about like things being four years behind, like NFTs are the perfect example, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who was deeply involved in, in development or crypto, like saw the potential of NFTs and not just for MBA top shot and people pieces, but the actual use case of non-fungible tokens. And now it's this huge, it's on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I didn't know it's on Saturday Night Live though. That's crazy. Wow. This weekend they did a the last week they did a huge sketch um, where one someone was Janet Yellen and someone was Eminem and they did an entire rap song on what NFTs are. Oh my god! Okay, I'll have to go look that up afterwards. Right, but that, that's <laughs> like we went from completely no awareness of what an M NFT was in the mainstream probably one to two months ago to Saturday Night Live. That's yeah, it's speeding up too, I guess, which is which is also crazy and good. Yeah. Right. But so can't we see that sort of velocity with what you're doing as well? In theory, if we hit a tipping point? I hope so. I mean, our, our theory is that there'll be enough utility to like existing crypto companies and that like this will be cool enough in general that like this will start picking up in terms of, you know, I, th I think if you're like a developer right now, like being able to apply privacy to what you're building is, is like a big advantage um, and something that like we want to help people do. So like I, I could see that happening, um, you know, you know, fingers crossed as we like, you know, take it. Right. And privacy is such a hot button item, both in the world, kind of as we discussed, but also within the crypto world. But we've seen some pushback on like privacy coins, you know, the Moneros and, and such of the world, them being delisted. Is there any like regulatory risk to what you're doing? Do you fear that they'll say, hey, man, we want this data? Like, <laughs> yeah. So, so we're actually like, not, not, not that, that would be funny. <laughs> we're actually approaching this like whole privacy thing from like a very different angle. Um, yeah, totally which, which is like, like, um, you have something like, like, let's say like a Zcash where, you know, you, you can move things into like the secure enclave and move things around in there privately. Um, so actually with, with Mina, we're doing like sort of like the opposite almost like, uh, the data we're injecting onto the chain is private. And then everything on chain is kind of just like normal, like, like Bitcoin. Um, so uh, I, I, there's definitely like not the same like kind of regulatory issues. Cause like, this is actually just like better from a regulatory perspective. Cause you're just not exposing sensitive information that like the regulations say you can't expose anyway on chain. Right. I think uh, it's like, sense. I, I don't have an answer to like the, like, I think eventually like we'll probably see privacy tokens built on top of Mina, but, um, it's like a bigger question that like, I have yeah. not like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's really interesting though, because basically you're taking all the advantages of the public ledger. I mean, like everyone can see, we sent this data here and here. They just can't see yeah. exactly all of the data that's in it, which is the biggest risk yeah. is leaking your data as we've seen with ledger or Equifax or, I mean, yeah, these huge data leaks are nothing new. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's just, it's so, so disgusting that you know that that can happen to people and it puts them at such risk totally it, it yeah it really, I mean, it really is yeah so so i'm curious how does this uh you know is it interoperable with other chains i know that there are permissionless bridges that exist but how does this sort of fit into the greater ecosystem as a whole so the the vision in, in general that for this is is that uh we have these very small zero knowledge proofs that we can verify very cheaply if you wanted to like verify like you know bitcoin on ethereum or something in like a full node way like well like good luck you have to like put everything onto ethereum it's not it's just like literally not happening but if you want to do the same with me now all you have to do is put the zero knowledge proof on top of ethereum which is a much you know it's, it's actually not only doable it's, it's very very doable so like uh the the vision is that you can put these zero knowledge proofs on all these different protocols and connect to them because like we do believe that like we don't want to be an island over here. We want to like help other people like take advantage of this stuff and use it themselves. And we have like a, a, a grant out right now uh, for an RFP with the Ethereum Foundation for doing this very thing with Ethereum. So we can start bringing some of those advantages to that chain. Okay, but Ethereum is super slow and clunky at this point, right? I know that those improvements are coming, but you know, you have this uh, light, light, fast chain <laughs> and then you move over to Ethereum and uh, I mean, I, I was just actually trading on Ethereum uh, before the show and gas fees were like $120 for any transaction. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the thing that's like, like, is that like, that's, I think clearly not where we want to end up. We we'd want it to be like, you know, gas fees are like a penny or, or less that everyone can use this stuff. And that's where we want to eventually go with Mina, but 
people are using Ethereum at one hundred and twenty dollars or whatever. Like it's, it's uh, I was utilities yeah. there. You 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 yeah. We're all we're all on it. The utilities um, there and the liquidity is there if you're actually trying to you know use swaps and things. Yeah. So so, I mean, well, well all that value is there on, on the chain. We like we definitely want to like you know, um, be part of that ecosystem and like see if we can you know plug in and helping some of the privacy features over. I think in the long term, it's like a different question. Like, you know, by then like ETH2 is out, like does ETH2 do what we wanted to maybe? And then like, I don't know, but <laughs> I would I would argue maybe not from a decentralization perspective, but a uh, different topic. Um, That's a worthy, we, it's a worthy topic, topic though. I mean, what do you, obviously ETH2 beyond the staking is still sort of like just endlessly delayed. Um, yeah. But do you think that ETH2 will solve a lot of the problems that we see with Ethereum? And do you think that that will happen anytime soon? Um, sort of. It's a fair <laughs> I, answer. I think, that, I, I, I think it's really complicated because ETH2 is trying to do a whole bunch of things between the proof of stake and sharding and scaling and all this stuff. My, my biggest concern with the ETH2 architecture and like, you know, please forgive me if you're like very deep in it. Like if anyone is like extremely deep into like the space is like the whole sharding approach in general seems like a little bit concerning to me that you now have parties which are only fully verifying particular shards and you have like this complex, you know, distribution problem of sending everyone else to their individual shards and you have to like kind of switch shards all the time if you want to know that another shard is like actually doing what you want versus like being evil. And then also like if you're really making an app, you have to like switch between the different shards at different times. Like if I'm an app developer, do I then have like full nodes in the different shards? Am I delegating this fully to like the proof of state consensus set? How big is that set going to be? I'm sure there's like, you know, reasonable like things put out about this so far, but like, um, I just feel like it's so complicated. Like, I just want to see what happens before, like, I really kind of believe. Right. So like, if yeah. that doesn't work, I mean, do you think that there, that, you know, we hear about Ethereum killers all the time, but it obviously never happens. And still, even with the faster, lighter blockchains, whatever, we don't see people really developing on them in the same way that we do Ethereum. I, I mean, I think it's, it's not just like an Ethereum thing. It's the core blockchain thing is that like, if you want to crank the scale up, you know, you need to have some way of verifying the scale you've just cranked up, which means that people, someone has to be verifying that, which means the decentralization has, has declined in some way. Right. Uh, and I, I think like with things like um, what we're doing with Agmina, we can like start kind of changing that as well as potentially like people kind of like ditching layer one Ethereum for like layer two zero knowledge proof stuff like secure rollups. Um, but I, I think that if ETH2 doesn't work, the space will have to like kind of grapple with like, well, what's what's our path forward? Um, yeah, it's not going to be thousand dollar gas fees certainly, um, <laughs> which is you know if it continues <laughs> at this rate, <laughs> yeah, it, it seems possible. So, what you got? I mean, is your plan effectively to be interoperable with everyone? You know, do you have to sort of choose your battles, or is there a path where like you know you can work with Cosmos and Elrond and you know and you've got totally. everyone's. I mean, there's definitely like kind of a bandwidth question of like, you know, what once like the first one is like done with like Ethereum, like how hard is it to do the rest of these things? Um, so like there's like a bandwidth question, but there's definitely like doing it with all these different protocols, I think would be like both like, I think kind of like somehow the right thing to do for like putting the ecosystem to, like together in some way, but also just like that's be it's easy because of the small proof. So we should do it. So... How is all this data that you need accessible and how far back and how hard is it to find old data, you know, to, to obviously make these foolproof? Yeah, I, I guess like, here's like a couple metaphors I would give to kind of explain what we're doing because I, I, it's different than the existing kind of paradigms for cryptocurrency. So the, the first I'll give is like extremely simple. It's like, you want to spend some money using your credit card. Like you don't have to look back at like your credit cards for like six years ago, if you want to do that. Like <laughs> doing that, it seems like an unnecessary thing that's on top of this. The other example I'll give for like programming is the way cryptocurrency is right now, it's sort of like the cryptocurrency has a history of like your hard drive, like forever back in time. It's like, you can never delete a file. You can only add new files. And like, it's as if the programs on your computer could access all the history of your hard drive since forever. And 
you know, if that is like a property that you can do, that's like, great. I mean, like, I'd love to have access to like mutable history forever. The, the problem is that it's not like a, a physically like kind of realistic property to have. Um, instead, the paradigm of Mina is that you programs can only touch and modify the current state of what's on Mina, similar to like how programs today can only touch what's on the current state of your hard drive. Um, which means that like, you know, if you want to keep things around, you got to put extra effort into it. You don't just like kind of get that for free. Uh, so this lets us kind of think about the world into two halves. We have like the history of everything and we have like the current state of everything. And what Mina does is it says, we're going to develop this system such that not everyone's going to hold the history of every single account. They'll hold a proof of it. You as a user can hold the history of your particular account. If you want to like have your particular credit, you know, score history or sorry, credit, credit card history. <laughs> But like, not everyone's gonna have to like look at, not everyone's gonna have to look at literally everything to like send a transaction or like write a program. Like that is not what we're trying to do. I'll stop there. <laughs> that, 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 that's kind of the metaphor for like the different paradigm that is being set up with, with Mina. Well, that makes a ton of sense and really explains it. Like who cares what all the data was? We just want to tell you that it's, it's correct and it's authentic, right? Yeah. So you guys, I've noticed uh, Mina has a really, really strong and passionate community. How, how, did, how did you build that? And I guess how, you know, why is that so important to have a passionate community in this space? Yeah. I, so, well, it took a while. <laughs> it, it took uh, two years to get where we are today. Um, it started with like 20 people on our Discord that like we like chatted about test nets with. <laughs> Like it's, it started really small, but like it kind of just like had that, you know, exponential curve over time where now we're at a place today where we do have like, we're fortunate to have a large community that um, is working with us on the protocol. Now, I think if we ask like why that happened, I think like both like we gave people opportunities to participate in like a real way on our network. We like developed it such that like you could have as many validators as you want. You're not limited to just like, you know, 20 or hundred or something. So I think like we created a lot of opportunity to get involved. Like you're not just like, you can actually do something real in the protocol, uh, which is, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the point. That's <laughs> it's important. Sure. And the other thing I think is that we set out from the very beginning, be very intentional about building a very different kind of community. Um, we noticed a lot of toxicity, a lot of arguing, a lot of um, kind of, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know what like, you know, just kind of like incentivized actors coming in and just like kind of, you know, <laughs> just like trying to mess with the place like, and that just kind of being the standard by which communities existed in and we wanted to do something that like was friendly that like we felt like reflected our values that like people could engage in and like this is something we've seen a lot of response to is people saying like, oh, like, you know, I love the Mina community. It's so friendly. Like, I love being here. Like, it's great. So I think that's like some background on what we've done and why it's worked and stuff. And I think that like, you know, this isn't to mention also just like the, the tech itself, I think is, is very, um, is, is important in this as well is that like the tech also kind of reflects those values we're putting forward to the community and that we do want to build something inclusive. We want to build something that like supports users and empowers them. So I think it's, it's a good fit with the, the technology as well. Um, I'll stop so I, don't, I don't see me. I don't see Mina Maxis fighting with Bitcoin Maxis on, uh, on Twitter very often. Right. So. Yeah. And there's no need to like, <laughs> we don't have to do that, but, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> everybody's at war with everybody in this space. I find it so sad. I just wish that everybody would get along and realize that uh, there's a place for everybody. And really, you know, there's so much, so much that we need to do together to, to really yeah. uh, move this space forward. Yeah. I think that's like, kind of goes well into like the second part of, of why we're, we're doing this. And like, I think that crypto is not just like a technology it's also like a social movement like if you could you could build like the most beautiful blockchain in the world and no one shows up to it it's like well good good job <laughs> like like i don't think that would actually happen but you know the people show up to it and that's what makes it what it is and i think that if we do want to build something that uh, you know can empower users it's important that they're involved in both like helping create and develop this this empowerment um so, I mean, I view the community is not just like an add-on to Mina, like community kind of is Mina. Uh, hmm. It's like, the, like, it's kind of our goal as a project to use the protocol to like marshal everyone into building better systems for themselves and for others. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious in the, in the privacy conversation, like one of the hot button topics in, you know, the, the whole space obviously is central bank, uh, 
digital currencies. And I'm curious what you think about their impact on privacy. I think the impact would be massive. Personally, you start there. Yeah. Um, well, I bet that by default, they're not going to be private. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that's fair. I'll say say that. that. I've, I've heard versions of them where they are private, but like, nobody's I, accepting them. Not yeah. Happening. Not happening. So I think that we do end up in a world where by default, a lot of these systems are not in the best interest of like the people behind those governments. And I think that there's nothing wrong with a central bank digital currency, but it's really important that they reflect like the will of the people and not the will of like a handful of companies that have, you know, been kind of brought into like the circle to build this thing. And I, I worry that that's, where it is heading by default in today's climate. Um, yes. And the central banks, obviously, because they would have, you know, perfect control of the money supply and would be able to kind of access your entire uh, transactional history, take your taxes yeah. right out of your wallet when they want it. <laughs> and, and what I think is interesting is like, theoretically, that should be okay because like we are the government and like we should decide what it is and that's fine. I think that the problem is that the government's increasingly like misaligned um, with the people from a democratic perspective versus companies. Um, so I think in practice, like I completely agree with you, uh, but um, I, 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 I like to imagine it, it could have been another way. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so one of the arguments, obviously a bullish argument for Bitcoin, I guess, is that they'll release central bank digital currencies. Everybody will get a digital wallet. They'll become familiar with digital wallets. They'll realize that their central bank currency is not private and they'll move to Bitcoin as the superior option. But do you think that Bitcoin is private well, at this point? I, I, it's funny because like, I do see that being like a very like kind of reasonable path to happen. At the same sure. time, like literally people are not, they wouldn't be getting any privacy at all. Like, like you're like, you're, yeah, like, yeah, they wouldn't, there's no privacy at all in that because if you can track the on and off ramps, even like just kind of once, you know, you just get like one insight into like, oh, like, this person bought, you know, I don't know, like a Tesla, like this is a dumb example, but maybe like in the future, like on Amazon or something, something at that point, it's, it's there. Like everyone can track all of your transactions on Bitcoin forward and backward in time. So like you're, you're, you're kind of screwed at that point. There's just like the, the pseudo anonymity doesn't work when you're starting to interact with like the real world. Um, and so I can totally see that happening, but it'll be hilarious when it does, because like, it's like, well, no, you did not get any privacy by this move. It's somebody, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot easier to track than cash, right? Yeah. I mean, so you know, the, the sort of the privacy of it in that regard is a bit of a myth. I, I sort of agree with you. It's re really interesting, though, to think about a world where people are, are pushed that far in uh, that direction. Uh, so um, what I got here? So I, I, I'm curious then, where do you think that uh, with the level of sort of adoption and interest that we've seen in the last year. I mean, do you think we're early in this? And I'm not talking about price cycles. I'm just talking about awareness and adoption. Do you think that we're early in this cycle or do you think that we're going to hit a wall and then it's going to kind of decline again? And, you know, I, I think that it depends what you're asking about. So I think that for a store of value, I think that the, the, you know, people get it. It's, it's like mainstream. It's, it's, it may be the beginning of mainstream, but I think that like, there's like this cross the chasm metaphor. I think that that's happened now for store value, like Bitcoin made it and it's, it's real now. I think that for like maybe literally anything else that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I think that from like last cycle, what I saw was like, you know, people like were really hyped about like, you know, Denticoin or whatever, like we're going to have all of our, our, you know, and and like not only what people realized was like not only was like the, the the business model not there, but also the tech wasn't even there. It didn't even work. Um, and what we saw since then was development of technologies that could potentially let things like that exist. You know, once they have a you know maybe on Bitcoin is your business model in the future. Someone prove me wrong. Right. <laughs> but but um, I think that's what's kind of next is like taking this base layer technology and making it real for for real products, real businesses and expanding beyond store value, which I think crypto is like destined to do. Um, uh, and I think that's like the, the, the next like kind of thing to, for it to do. Yeah. We have like 6,000 coins on coin market cap. Man, that's, that, that is insane. 
you know, so I think it's fair to say that there'll be a culling, right? And then we're going to yeah. trim a whole lot of fat, probably like 99% of it. And that the few that actually have real utility and value will be left standing, don't you think? I think eventually um, there's still like, you know, some some tokens around that from last cycle that like I was like kind of like thinking um, these really make sense. These technolo the technology is not even real, like, like, um, <laughs> But you know, there's some of them are still around today. Most of them are gone. I think that it's a kind of gradual, random process. But I, I do agree in the limit for sure. No, I, I guess I just disagree. Then yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just uh, it's it's the easiest analogy is like the '90s, obviously, internet boom, right? Because you saw like uh, you know the pets.com die, and then the right. Amazons and the Googles survived. So I wonder if we'll see like. 10 people come out of it and they're just like 10 of the biggest companies in the world and everybody else disappears. Maybe. I mean, I, I hope that there's, there's, I guess like, I think that that will happen at the protocol layer um, is, is, is how I'm thinking about it. I think that will happen at the protocol layer because like the returns to network effects for those protocols are just so big. I think that for application type things, even for things like where there's like, you know, file storage, for example, there could be multiple of those. Um, but I do think there will be like some sort of consolidation when the stuff picks up real traction. Sure. Do you think we get to a place where, I mean, for example, like when you use your phone, you don't think about what's powering your phone. When you use the internet as a normal person, you in no way do you consider how the internet works. You just know that you can like pull something up on your browser. Do you think that blockchain becomes that uh, you know, proliferates to the level where it's just the underlying technology and so many things, and we have no idea that it's there. I think so. Yeah. I mean, this is like sort of the vision that Mina laid out earlier is like you log in with like your email address, like you don't know it's a private key or whatever. And then you just start using it with various websites, like as an integration. And it's just kind of like the same way you sign in, like with Google, like single sign on today. It's just like another service on the internet you use that brings all these cool primitives you didn't think was possible before. Um, I, I like, with or without me, I think that'll happen eventually. Like our goal is to like speed it up. Um, uh, so no, I, I completely agree. Like that that's what I, yeah, that's what's going to happen. I think. Awesome. I know we're getting there with the, with the time. Um, is there any parting thoughts, anything you're really excited about uh, for you guys and in the space, you know, in the, in the coming months and years, immediate, you know, in, in the more immediate future. I'll say something like very, like, so if, if we're, we'll soon be like giving opportunities to people to like start building snaps on, you know, and like I mentioned, this like gives new primitives in terms of privacy, in terms of putting large computations on chain that I think will be very exciting. So like, if you want to like get involved with that, like, please like, you know, start following us, check out our community. Cause like, um, we don't expect like, there's going to be like a billion people like using that immediately. But if you're one of the people that do want to be like kind of on the ground floor of building this thing with us, like, please like join in. We want to like, you know, help build it with you. That's awesome. So where can everybody follow you and keep up with what you guys are doing yourself and the companies? Yeah. So, uh, our folks, so, uh, first is our, our Twitter, just mean a protocol that mean a protocol is like the one for the protocol <laughs> for me at Evan a Shapiro is my Twitter. Uh, you can find me there. Also, uh, our discord is like where like us in the community are usually like just kind of chatting more casually. So if you want to just pop in, that's the place to go for that. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. You gave me a lot to think about. And I think that these are the kind of things that people don't realize are happening and are going to be probably the most impactful use cases of, of blockchain. So it's really, really impressive. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It was really fun chatting on them. Awesome. Thanks. So